Holy One, guide our hearts towards compassion and guide our minds towards understanding. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and minds together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. In September of 2008, on a tiny strip of land in Alaska known as Gravina Island, workers put down their shovels and parked their stream rollers for the last time. The road was completed. And this was not just any road. The road now known as Gravina Island Highway was nearly 30 years in the making. Research began in the 1980s the intention being to connect the nearby town of Ketchikan with the airport located on this island, about a mile and a half away from each other, thus eliminating the need for a ferry that carried some 350,000 people every year. This completed road, 3.2 miles long, starts at the airport and was destined to be connected to the Gravina Island Bridge. Except, Herein lies the rub. If you go visit this road today, you'll start at the airport, and 3.2 miles later, you'll wind up in a dead-end cul-de-sac. The bridge, which was to cost a whopping $398 million, was never approved of by Congress, and so the project was indefinitely shelved. But here's the real kicker. The powers that be in Alaska knew before the road was begun that this bridge would never be constructed. They also knew that the money that had been earmarked for this road would have gone back to the federal government if it had not been spent making this particular road. So the decision was made to build this meaningless stretch of road and pavement which has since been appropriately dubbed by media as the road to nowhere. The road to nowhere received massive media attention upon its completion in 2008. They blamed its construction on the person in power who could have chosen to stop this silliness, but chose not to. As an aside, you may remember that Alaska as a whole was making lots of headlines in 2008. And we could play the game of three guesses who, but it would probably take only one for most of you to come up with the name of a certain Alaskan governor who chose to bless the construction of the road to nowhere. This wonderful little blast from the past brings us to our lectionary text this morning, which takes a closer look at the concept of wisdom when building something, specifically building a foundation. To understand what Paul is talking about in this passage, let us first take a little journey back in time to Corinth, to the community to whom Paul wrote these words. The city of Corinth, you may remember, was a bustling hub of activity in Paul's day. It was a very, very wealthy city for its time. Its opulence based on the trade of artisans' products, specifically bronze and pottery. Corinth prided itself on religious diversity. Archaeologists have noted that both Greek and Egyptian shrines coexisted there very peacefully. And even the Jews found a place of acceptance in this city, which was incredibly unusual at this time in the Roman Empire. However, the picture for Corinth was hardly all sunshine and roses. The vast wealth of this culture was often created at the expense of the poorer districts of the city, and the poor suffered terribly. It was in this community that Paul made inroads and began the church to which he writes. Oftentimes, even today, the Christian church finds acceptance in places where there is oppression among the poor, among those who are hurting, people who need to hear good news. So the church in Corinth was no different. It had some wealthy patrons, but it was mostly made up of the poorer class. 
Racially, it was actually more varied. The names mentioned in this letter show that there were those with Greek and Latin and Jewish backgrounds in its midst. So Paul was writing to a group of pretty diverse people, if not socioeconomically speaking, certainly people with different ethnic and political and religious backgrounds. Okay, so with this diversity, it would come as no surprise to learn that Paul would write about unity in this passage. And what unites these very different people? Only one thing, the foundation of Jesus Christ. And upon that solid foundation, says Paul, they can continue to build together. There was some shakiness in this foundation. There was some concern in the group about which teacher some of these individuals had heard from originally and which teacher they chose to follow, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas. In today's terms, this would be sort of like psychologists labeling themselves as Jungian psychologists or Rogerian or Freudian. And of course, today's theologians do the same thing. Ask any 12 ministers about their opinions on a certain topic, and you'll hear about 12 different theologians with different theories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. To the Corinthians, Paul says, in essence, forget all that stuff. You don't need to know everything. Don't be unwise and build a bridge to nowhere or a foundation that won't last. You're all rooted in Jesus Christ. Christ is your foundation and your source of wisdom. For Paul knows that these divisions among the Corinthian church are just that. They're divisions that take their eyes off of the prize. Divisions that can be a convenient excuse for being a bridge to nowhere. Divisions that prevent them from using their God-given wisdom for doing the things they were called to do, like serving the poor like caring for the hurting souls in their midst, reaching out to neighbors with a hot meal or a warm hug or a kind smile, wisdom that doesn't limit anyone to their own head, but allows the experience of the life-changing power of God, body, heart, mind, and soul. Wisdom that is based on a foundation of Jesus Christ, Jesus' life and teachings and sacrifice and promise of new life and resurrection and love. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not a sermon combating intellectualism or discourse of that sort. For being smart and caring about wisdom is vastly important and can be a useful vessel of both knowledge and a deeper appreciation of God's working in this whole world. What a wonderful gift we have to be able to use our minds in such a way. But when it devolves into yet another intellectual exercise that has no bearing on how we actually live, when our conversation about God and about having it all figured out doesn't become a bridge that connects us to one another, but instead a bridge to nowhere, we find ourselves in the place that Paul talks about. Paul's words from verses 19 through 20 are biting. He catches the wise in their craftiness, and the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. They're futile. While it sounds like Paul is poo-pooing wisdom here, he is actually speaking very highly of it just a few verses before. So it's a little shaky what Paul is talking about, but I think it focuses on wisdom that is rooted in Christ. For that is something he echoes time and time again. These thoughts of the wise that Paul mentions come in a lot of different shades, and it can be confusing, but it could probably best be boiled down into one commonality, that of arrogance. The Corinthian leaders were wondering about how to follow, and were trying their best to do it, and to do it correctly just as we are today. The difference is that they were trying to do something that Paul considers not rooted in their foundation. If only we follow leader X, or belief system Y, or if we pray just right, 
or if we try this meditation practice, or if we do it in such a way, or do so many good things in our community, surely then we'll be all set. We'll have it figured out, right? We'll be doing the right thing and getting it right. This type of thinking creates a very different foundation in one's faith. It is a foundation about us finding the right answer and doing it, being right, being wise. But that's not about Jesus. And while all of the things I mentioned and all of the answers that we fill our lives with are good things in and of themselves, these things can't be the foundation for our faith. Only Jesus can be that foundation, that bridge and road wisely crafted and created with purpose and intentionality, that bridge and road that lead us somewhere and not to a dead-end cul-de-sac like our story from the beginning of my sermon. Probably like all of you, I have had my own experience of gaining and losing this wisdom. Many of you have probably heard that I am an ordained minister, in case the get-up didn't tell you that. And I was serving full-time as an associate pastor in a UCC church in Marblehead until last fall. By all accounts, I thought I had finally figured things out. I was enjoying my job. Pursuing ordained ministry is a calling I first felt in middle school and has since been fostered within me. It's a great joy to serve in this way for me. I had attended a credible seminary, and part of my studies focused specifically on Christian education and youth ministry, which was the bulk of the work I was doing at my previous church. I felt as though because of my training and experience, I had some knowledge in working with children and youth. I had done this in various capacities for years, so of course I had gleaned tremendous nuggets of wisdom. And then I became a mom. Ooh. My son, Zach, is 16 months old today. And for those of you who are parents, you'll be able to relate when I say that I realized in about two minutes that what I thought I knew about kids and parenting amounted to very, very little. Parents and non-parents alike among you, have you ever had the experience of thinking that you know conceptually what's going on with a given situation? You, you have a sense of it, you got it down of thinking that you have wisdom in that area, and then being hit upside the head with actual wisdom, realizing that your prior so-called knowledge all of a sudden goes actually to a deeper level that you didn't know was possible. Wisdom is a gift that comes directly from God, at God's timing, not ours, and through very little effort on our part other than our willingness to be available to receive that gift. Wisdom cannot be forced. It simply flows. There is a reason that many biblical scholars point to the word wisdom, Sophia in the Greek language, and liken it to the Holy Spirit, which scripture tells us blows where it will. This is what happened to me when my son was born. I never knew I could be so exhausted and so stretched, so scatterbrained, so full of worry. But as I hold that little body and that little soul that has been entrusted to my husband and to me, I also knew that my heart could never love like this before. My experience in mommyhood made my heart grow in wisdom. And I realized that while undoubtedly called into ministry, I also felt another call an undeniable pull to stay at home with Zach, which led me to leave my ministerial call for the time being in favor of staying at home with him full time. So much for the so-called wisdom I had about children and about myself and my calling from God in this world, it all changed. And it all changed at a time when I was ready to hear it. I wonder, is it the same for you? Is God leading you to a place of new wisdom that you haven't thought about before? And 
thinking in this way often makes our prior wisdom look much more like folly if we're really honest about it. For Paul, the foundation of the church is wise only when it is rooted in Jesus Christ, not through our own efforts, our own anxieties. As Paul says in verse 11, no one can lay any other foundation for the Corinthians, and I would argue for us today as well. Later in the passage, he writes, all things are yours, all belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. If I had a little flow chart, I could show it. it all belong to us because we belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. All of these things flow from God, but it's when that flow gets messed up that we find ourselves off track. For us hearing this today, the message can be both uplifting and challenging at the same time. On the one hand, if we remember that we belong to God, that God holds us in the palm of God's hands and cares about us more than we could ever begin to imagine or understand, what good news that can be to know that we don't have to have it all figured out all of the time, to let go of that pressure and know that God will give us the wisdom when we need it. How incredibly freeing. However, Living that way all of the time is really, really hard. How often do we consciously remember that we belong to God, that God is in control, not our so-called wisdom? How often do we try to build bridges of our own creation and our own best efforts and best of intentions, but instead forget to trust in God's wisdom and God's foundation? for this church as a community and for us individually in our lives. If we did remember to trust God more often, we'd worry a whole lot less. There would be less anxiety, less sniping, less meaningless arguments over who is right. There would be more sharing, more compassion, more love. We'd be more, what's that word? Oh, yeah, we'd be more Christian. But this is so hard to do that we eventually fail. We simply aren't perfect. The tendency towards thinking that we are wise, that we want to have some things figured out, or at least that we try to figure them out on our own, not in community, that is the tendency towards which we are all drawn in our human condition. Which brings me to the point in my sermon that one of my former teachers used to refer to as the okay, so now what point. All of this exposition and build up to the climax of what are we gonna do with this? Thank God our buddy Paul doesn't leave us guessing. The answer in typical Pauline fashion is actually quite simple, but by no means easy. Verses 16 through 17. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? God's temple is holy and you are that temple. The Greek you that Paul uses here is plural, which means that this was not written to an individual, but to a community, to a church. In short, Paul says this, you all together are already holy. At the risk of sounding a little like Obi-Wan Kenobi from Star Wars, the force is already within you. The answer is already here, for God lives within you. The Holy Spirit will give us wisdom. Pilgrim Congregational is a very holy place. It is a place to be honored and cared for, it is a place that has wisdom if it remembers that that foundation is Jesus Christ and not our own thinking. May this community remember the wisdom that it has, that it stems from that solid foundation and nowhere else. May you all continue to honor the Holy Spirit who dwells within you here so that you may go from here and do the good work to which you are called. May the triune God come first 
and all the good works that you are doing stem from that place of love. May we all endeavor to be wise, head, heart, body, and soul, rooted in the knowledge that God holds you, so that this community can be a bridge built wisely, a bridge leading somewhere, that somewhere being whatever new and exciting chapter God has in store for all of you, both individually and in this community as a whole. May it be so for all of us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.